Once again, we're so glad you've chosen to study with us today, the very last Sabbath of this particular quarter. There's a lot we're going to be talking about, but before we get started, let's bow our heads for prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you once again for your word and your guidance. Be with our conversation and just guide and direct. And we thank you so much in your precious name. Amen. Well, we've got a lot to talk about, so we want to save as much time for that conversation and study, so let's go right into our mission story. So we, we spoke to uh, some of the leaders in the municipalities, the mayors and these things, uh, and sort of representatives, and we asked them what are the real needs in the community, and one area that really stuck out as a major uh, need was, uh, was loneliness. In Sortland, Norway, loneliness is a key challenge among both the elderly and the young. About one-third of the teenagers here say they feel lonely. So this is why we, we started thinking, well, what can we as a church do to, uh, to contribute and meet that need? Uh, we're trying and failing uh, and uh, seeing what works, what doesn't work, and through that uh, learning, they d don't necessarily know the, the name of God and who he is, but a lot of people do believe there is a God. Um, and so, belief in God is quite typical, at the same time as traditional church is seen as problematic in regard to the core cultural values. This region was one of the key areas for Adventism in Norway. Uh, we had areas here with the highest density of Adventists in, uh, in all of Norway. And now our churches are very much dying. Similar to many places around the world, the church has lost its foothold, struggling to be known as an integral part of the community. Can the church still be relevant here in Sortland? Pastor Kenneth believes so. The key is forming connections where people are and meeting their most painful needs. The family structures uh, is sort of something also this under attack uh, in this region. Uh, sort of a lot of unstable uh, family relationships. So we had a family retreat recently we wanted to place a focus upon families spending time together. Uh, so that was the overall goal, um, strengthening family bonds. Over the six days of the retreat, the eight families focused on spending wholesome time together. Organized activities like crafts and games provided opportunities for bonding and a lot of laughter and smiles. It was very positive, it was very encouraging. They were so grateful because these families were also families that couldn't afford uh, vacation themselves. So this was part of it also. We were offering them a vacation experience and uh, they were just so grateful for, for that experience. And uh, friendships uh, building over that week we had spent together was, uh, so it was a very encouraging time. It has been sort of uh, quite touching also seeing how God has been opening doors that we did not expect when they see uh, we as a church really wanting the best for the community. Um, so they've given access where we can sort of be quite, quite bold and open about faith uh, and, and it's received quite well as well. So I think uh, this is not something 
we've been doing, but, but it's uh, seeing how God is working on the lives of people and the hearts of people and opening doors that seemed very closed. Please pray for church members in Sortland, Norway. Pray that God uses them to overcome the challenges of loneliness, broken families, and skepticism in the community, and that through this, people can come to know Jesus personally. This quarter, a portion of your 13 Sabbath offering will help build a center of influence for Pastor Kenneth and the church members to host programs and events geared toward the community. The offering will also help construct an urban center of influence in Cyprus and establish a church in Serbia. Please consider how you can support these projects through prayer and by giving to this offering. How amazing it is that Adventism continues to be relevant from Namibia to Norway. And today, today we want to ask and make a plea for relevancy by having you consider four simple words. Because it is there. That string of otherwise uninteresting words becomes a powerful answer to the question asked about the British mountaineer George Mallory. The question, why would one try and conquer Everest. Now, I know what you're thinking, and I know that the temptation is simply to dismiss Mallory as a thrill-seeking European explorer. But before you do that, consider the possibility that human beings have a primal relationship with mountains. We are engaged in an existential ascent, a quest to reclaim our footing on the slopes of what poet Joe jo Milton refers to as paradise lost. And today, today I want to look at a mountain, at a mountain that is meaningful and powerful in scripture. It is a mountain found in Luke's gospel, the fourth chapter. Now consider the preceding verses in our story. A voice has just been heard from heaven and is the voice of a God who utters a powerful confession. This is my son and in him I am well pleased. Immediately after the confession, Luke gives us a genealogy, a genealogy that connects Jesus to Adam, also known as the Son of God. And so the stage is set and a typology is constructed by which the author of Luke's Gospel is attempting to have us connect Jesus, the Son of God, with Adam. Now, mountains loom large in the psyche of Jews. After all, it was at a mountain that the kingdom that was known to be Israel was established, a constitution given by God on the peak of Sinai. It was at a mountain that the temple was built. It was on a mountain that the city of peace was constructed. Oh, mountains loom large for Jews. And so here we are again at a mountain. And Luke begins his account simply by telling us that Jesus is now full of the Holy Spirit. He returns to Jordan, and what I find appalling is that it is the Spirit who leads him into the wilderness. Now for you and I, wilderness during summer is connected with this idea of camping trips, fires, maybe a couple s'mores. But in Jesus' time, the wilderness was a troubling place, a place full of terrors, wild beasts, and encounters with evil. You see, the wilderness always st stalking, always there, attempting to rob the people of light and civilization. The wilderness was a dangerous place. And it is the spirit that leads Jesus to this place. Now, throughout the history of Scripture, the wilderness is a place for self-reflection. It is a place for testing. It is a place for growth. It is a place for new beginnings. And so added to the typology of Jesus as this new figure, this new Adam, is the notion of peaks and wilderness. Again, Luke isn't doing geography. He's doing theology. And the point is simple. 
Here we have Jesus in this place of testing, and he enacts a period of fasting that lasts 40 days. And you and I know what that means, don't we? You and I understand well the symbolism of the number 40. Because not only is Luke attempting to connect us to the garden back in Genesis, he's also attempting to link us to the Exodus story. Forty years, the Israelites dwelled in the wilderness. Forty years, they received the protection of God. Forty years, their faith was tested. Forty years, they were forced to reconstruct a paradigm of what it meant to be God's people. And now, for 40 days, Jesus engages in this desert-dwelling cycle. Now, notice that at the end of the 40 days, he became hungry. And verse 3 tells us that the devil encounters him and asks a question. Remember the typology. If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Now, when we're thinking and reading the story superficially, it seems like what the devil is simply asking from Jesus is, why don't you prove that you are divine? Prove that you are the Son of God by transforming these boulders into bread. But you see, the subtext tells us much more. For what Luke is attempting to say is to have us think about that Exodus, Exodus experience. Think about the manna that God delivered for 40 years to the people of Israel. Think about the temptation to do things our own way, to resolve issues in a manner that is pleasing to us, and think about what the story of Exodus is as it continues to affirm the notion that God will take care of our daily needs. So the story is not simply about transforming boulders into bread. No, the story is much deeper than that, and it's about trust. You see, Scripture is there, as we've been saying throughout this quarter, to imbue the believer with trust in God. So we read Scripture, but we don't read it simply to construct theology or to hammer out doctrine, important as those things are. We read it because we are invested in this relationship with God And the framework first said relationship is trust. So Jesus answers. He answers by going back and quoting scripture. He answers by moving us back to the book of Deuteronomy. He answers by having us reflect. And the story is there in the book of Deuteronomy. In the eighth chapter, as God is moving Israel out of the wilderness. He he is reminded that man, Israel, shall not live by bread alone. Now, as Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. The idea and the typology becomes so dense, we can barely, we can barely ignore it. And we brush away the imagery of Genesis because what Jesus is really saying is just as Adam reached out in order to take the fruit and eat, I will refrain from eating because man shall not live by bread alone. We shall subsist and endure through trust. And my dear friend, that is why this Sabbath we are inviting our community. That is why today we are inviting you to engage with us in a day of fasting and prayer. Because the body needs more than simple bread. The body needs to be grounded in a relationship that breeds trust with a God who moves us to new and exciting relationships. Now think about the contrast there. Adam fails. He reaches out in the midst of a lush garden. As he is promised a feast of fruit with only the prohibition of not touching one tree. And on the other hand, you have Jesus Jesus 
in an arid and desolate landscape, famished by fasting. Ah, but he is able to recognize that which our first father failed to see. And that is that we are created not just to eat, drink, and be merry. We are created to connect with God. And Paul Tillich, that brilliant Christian theologian of the 20th century, said that human beings are not only homo sapien, we are also homo religious. We have in each one of us a God-shaped heart a hole that cannot be filled by bread. It has to be satiated by his spirit. But the devil isn't done yet. He has learned to be relentless through the desert dwelling cycles of many a person. And so, so he takes Jesus to a vantage point, to another hill. And he has them look down at the kingdoms of the earth. And as he is having him look down, he offers a deal. He says to Jesus, all of these kingdoms I can give to you if you but bow down and worship me. Again, the connections with Genesis are so dense that we have to brush away the mental images. So let me ask you, just between you and I, what was the primary problem with Adam? What was Adam's true sin? Was it that he ate the fruit? Was it that he wanted to be like God? Or was it that he believed in a lie? Namely, he failed to recognize that God had already made him like God. Think about the language in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Let us make humankind in our image. You see, Adam traded his birthright for something that already belonged to him. But it belonged to him through submission. The ability to simply let go of control and tell God, please be in charge. The ability to say to God, you know the end from the beginning. You have a plan for me. And the plan and the desire of your heart is not to harm me, but to give me happiness and a future. And just like Adam was already like God, Jesus already owns the kingdoms of the world. These kingdoms belonged to him. And we look around and we see how broken our systems are, how broken the kingdoms of men are, how ripe they are for abuse and oppression, for division, how we create desolation through strong men and democratic processes that favor a certain group and alienate another. That's the kingdom of men. But the world still belongs to God. This is still our Father's world. And so Jesus doesn't buy into the lie. He recognizes something. He recognizes that the kingdom that he has come to create can only be enacted through the cross. He flips the paradigm on its head. To be sure, the cross and resurrection are violent. These are violent acts. Acts that demand suffering and sacrifice. You know, God abhors violence, but justice demands that God feels something. Abraham Joshua Heschel talks about the beauty of the God of pathos, a God that is moved by injustice. So much so that he acts. The cross is God's violent revolution against oppression, violence, and division. It is his invitation to partake in a new kingdom. 
but it's also it's also a demand for trust and submission when we pray and we say your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven we are saying that we believe inherently that god's kingdom has come and that his will is being done on this this broken world but you might be asking how is god's will being done well The simple answer to that question is it is being done through you and through me, through each one of us that that renounce the kingdoms of men, that disengage from a language that pushes to divide and abuse each other, and engages in a new song, in a new way of speaking, the way of the cross the way of ultimate submission. Satan again moves back after Jesus quotes scripture. And as he is moving back, he is attempting to regroup. Maybe to orient the discussion in a different way. So this time he tempts Jesus by taking him to another peak. Now we are at the top of the temple. And if we look down, we can almost see them, that crowd of Pharisees and Sadducees arguing about angels in heaven, about leveret marriage, and about Sabbath. But divided as those groups were, they would have agreed on one thing, the idea that the Messiah would appear at the top of the temple. Satan invites Jesus to come down. And it's an invitation that will again echo that call that Jesus will hear while he hangs on the cross. Come down and prove that you are the Messiah. Reject the way of submission. Reject the path of trust. Turn away from the cross. And Jesus will have none of it. But Satan, wily as he is, that tempter will now use scripture. He will say, come down. Throw yourself down, for it is written that he will send his angels so that your foot may not be crushed against a stone. You can see the history of humankind in the balance. You can see Adam's failures as he exchanges his birthright in a lush garden. You can almost picture and look forward at the passion and the pain that Christ will endure. And you realize That great as the defeat that Adam was, Christ's victory will be even more magnificent. For it is birth through a magnanimous God. Oh, Adam failed the test. Israel? Israel got mixed results even as God continuously attempted to use them as a paradigm for trusting, convicted, and submitted relationships. But Jesus will not fail. He knows that the only way to gain total and absolute victory isn't by coming down, but rather by going up. And going up on a cross and identifying with every single human being through that act that is felt loneliness, pain, anguish, and abuse. <laughs>
the great American theologian James Cone, reflecting on this particular passage, says that the experience of being Christian in America can never be understood unless we are able to converge the cross and the tree. Cone is referring to those people who were beaten on trees, who hung from trees, and in that sentence... He opens our eyes to a greater reality, namely that God wants to connect with whatever pain you are experiencing because victory is attained through empathy. And so he will turn back to the accuser and simply state, it is written, thou shall not test the Lord your God. And he quotes that beautiful passage in Deuteronomy. The passage that became the hallmark of Israel's Exodus story, their desert dwelling cycle. We are tested. And Jesus will still be tested. But God, God remains above reproach. Because God is experiencing pain, privation, loneliness, and suffering as he showers his creation with empathy. Now Luke concludes this particular passage, this beautiful pericope, by simply saying that at that mention, the devil left Jesus and awaited a more opportune time to tempt him. We know. We know what Luke has in mind. He hasn't only connected us to garden and exodus exile. Oh, he's pushing us to consider the cross. For once again, Jesus will climb. He will climb the peak called Golgotha. On a Friday, we still refer to as good for me and for you. Through this quarter, we've engaged in conversations that have been difficult. We've been uncomfortable. We've danced with difficult texts and examined conscientious and contentious excursus. But we continue going back to Scripture because it is there. It is there that we can find the best picture of the God we serve. So continue climbing. May Scripture serve as the axe that your hopes and your dreams cling on. May scripture serve as a water that satiates your thirst in your desert dwelling cycles. And may scripture be the place where you can retreat to that lush garden that makes life beautiful. May scripture be the witness to the God who is all things to all people. Continue to engage with it because it is there. Stu, let's talk about scripture at the end of our journey and how one can use it for our everyday life. Well, I think it's such a powerful kind of example of the role scripture can pay, play in our lives with the whole temptation with Christ and, and Satan and using scripture to try and tempt or distortions of scripture. And I, and I also I find it fascinating, Satan was using sort of scripture, but also tradition, you know, the idea that he was up on the corner of the temple, kind of combining those. And I don't think that that technique hasn't, hasn't changed, I think, over the centuries. But one of the things you start out kind of in that whole narrative is how Jesus was trusting in God. And something that uh, 
really moved me a number of years ago. If you recall, Jesus is baptized, and then the, the dove comes down, and there's this, this is my son. So there's clear communication to Jesus that he is the son of God. And then you get into the temptation, and there's all, if you're the son of God, if, 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 if. So God provided clarity to Christ in terms of what his relationship was. And I, I'd like you to comment, I believe that God wants to give us those, as much as we talk about tension in scripture and things that we need to maybe not have all the answers to, but I, I do believe there's an essence that God wants to give us clarity in terms of our relationship to him. How would you, how would you comment to that statement? I think you're absolutely right, and I think the best way I can I can comment on that statement is by pushing us to ask a question. And the question is about uh, pertaining your identity and who you are, because identity matters, and who you believe yourself to be matters. It it is a key component in the way you comport yourself. A few uh, years ago, I went back to um, my father's uh, home home country in Latin America, and I was I was introduced to a this whole new facet to my father that I never knew. You know, I knew the man who came to this country uh, to forge a better life. I knew about the lover of poetry who bequeathed that to me. I knew about the great conversationalist and the quiet leader. But there was this whole other part of my dad's life that I didn't know about. Um, I didn't know that he would... wake up at five in the morning while he was still in elementary to go work in the fields before school. I didn't know that when my grandmother died and my father was still very young, he cared for his siblings. I didn't know that at 16, he was already running a business. And I didn't know that his love for soccer translated to talent that I only dream of having. And so when I went back to my father's hometown and was regaled by these stories, I'll tell you, Stu, I left walking a little taller because when people saw me in that small town, they would say, there he goes. That's the son of Miguel. Stu, up to that point, uh, being Americanized and growing up uh, in this country, everybody called me Michael. Um, my birth certificate reads Michael. And it was at that moment feeling this immense sense of pride because of who my father was. I decided to be known and to refer to myself as Miguel. I wanted people to know that that was my dad. That's who God is. And scripture tells us about this whole new facet to God. You know, you look at the world and you see the pain and the suffering and all the things that we're dealing with. And the question we ask is, where is God? And here scripture opens up this new facet to the God who becomes human and who climbs on a cross. And it changes our identity. It ought to change the way we refer to ourselves. And so now... Now I think, Stu, that when you're asking about clarity and trust, I think that that begins by recognizing that you have been called to be royalty, that you are a prince and a princess. And if you start believing and referring to yourself in that way, it's much easier to trust the king of the universe. Well, I think I I love something I believe you said or something close to this where we're talking about trusting in God, not in theology and doctrine. And some might take that to mean we're diminishing the role of doctrine in theology. But I I think it, for me, it kind of helps clarify the purpose of doctrine in theology. Like 
it's so common to hear people really diminishing doctrine. And I certainly understand why, because doctrine has become more creed or this list of things that we have to believe to belong or to be okay with God or all that kind of stuff. And so instead of doctrine being the means to help describe different facets of, of, of God, you know, Jesus our Savior, the Bible, the Scriptures, all these things are help are supposed to help us understand God as opposed to rules to qualify to be in a relationship with God. But I still like the idea of, of and I think it's so important to understand, we're really trusting in God, not in doctrine and theology. Those are things that point to God, and it's ultimately God. Because another aspect in this particular story, the temptation, there's a lot of so you won't be deceived kind of statements, and, and a lot of sermons kind of touched on those spaces and, and where I feel that's really important. I think one of the things where that can lead us down uh, kind of an unfortunate path is we get so focused on making sure we don't get deceived, we're not getting to know the Savior. Mm. Mm. It, it, is that kind of a, a description that, that you can relate to, Miguel, in terms of observing or maybe even experiencing yeah. yourself? Yeah, well, Stu, um, I, I, the reason I love this story um, is because it, it provides some really clear connections, connections that force us to think about Exodus and Genesis. And the Exodus story, I think, is, is important as you're talking about this, this idea, Stu, um, of being deceived. Now, we've all read the Exodus account, and we've read about the pillar of fire and the cloud of smoke that provided both protection and, from the parching and scalding sun and from wild animals. We've read about the quail and the, ma and the manna. And yet, even after all of that, Israel comes to the border of Canaan and looks at the cities and is fearful of tall guys yeah. and big walls. They, they're, they're afraid. They're petrified. They say, we can't go up against them. And I'm thinking, wait a second. God just parted the Red Sea and swallowed up the most powerful army in existence, and you're afraid of a few walls? I think it's because doctrine doesn't equate to God as you've so clearly articulated. Doctrine is our best way of speaking about God, but language evolves, and language shifts. Now, I know we've, we've pointed out through these things 13 weeks, so some issues that our church and our faith tradition has. But we'd be remiss if we didn't note some of the amazing things that Adventism has to contribute to the broader conversation. The Bible isn't the 28 fundamental beliefs, but these beliefs, when understood with the Graybill preamble, that simply states that these doctrines that we hold near and dear to us are our best ways of speaking about God at a, at a particular moment in time, then we recognize that Scripture isn't about doctrine. It's about the God that created it all. And as long as our doctrine helps us explain that God in meaningful ways, then doctrine is great. But let's not confuse ourselves the real deception is almost never between things that we think are orthodox versus things that we think are heretical. And think about the, the big debate in the early church, circumcision versus non-circumcision, and the orthodoxy of circumcision versus the heresy of being a Gentile. That's not what Scripture is about. The real issues and the real opportunities for deceit within the Bible are in our inability to communicate accurately who God is. And the only way we get to connect with God is by being intentional about the time we spend with Him.
Jesus isn't deceived. Jesus isn't deceived because he knows the Father and he has recognized that he belongs to the Father. Yeah, it reminds me of a, a thought, a note that I wrote down while you were speaking, uh, talking earlier. It's knowing Scripture, you know the Savior. Knowing Scripture, you know the Savior. And the reason I, I wrote that down, it's kind of in the context of deceit, the focus on we don't want to be deceived. And I, I don't want to dis, d, d, diminish that. But so many things, it's, it's just in, in terms of the angle you're looking at it, is the focus on making sure you're not deceived or is the focus in the relationship with Jesus? And I, I realize some feel like that's making the whole dynamic too simplistic. It's the relationship with Jesus. But the more I explore that, that is what it's about. The relationship with Jesus is what's going to keep us from being deceived when we know what God is like, when we know what he is going to do or how he respond. So we have all these illustrations in the very garden. Adam basically didn't trust God. It's why he took the fruit. In, in you know, our own understanding, when you read uh, in our, our church, you know, we, have, we refer to Ellen White. In these classes, in, in the Sabbath school, we don't tend to do that because we want to focus on the word, but it's very helpful she describes a scenario where, you know, Adam kind of knew it was wrong, but he didn't want to lose Eve. And so he didn't trust God to take care of the situation. And then they hide. They're afraid. It's that they don't know how God's going to react. And I would say centuries and centuries have permeated this idea that God is against us, that we somehow have to prove ourselves to God. And so this focus on making sure we don't get deceived takes us off the idea of, of knowing Scripture means we know the Savior. And I, I just feel that that's so important. Now, one of the things this lesson kind of opened up with, and I'm going to read the text, it's actually, uh, it's quoted from James 1.22, and it's the King James, a New King James Version. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Now, I found that kind of interesting. Uh, there's the be be more than hearers. Don't just talk about the word. Be doers of it. And I found it interesting that deception was kind of connected with that. Why do you think that was? I think it's because you you said it right. Knowing scripture equates or ought to equate to knowing the Savior. And if you know the Savior, the way you know scripture changes. Now think about Luke. We, we've been living in Luke. Um, any good Jew would have been able to recite uh, this 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 command in in Deuteronomy, right? To love your neighbor as you would love yourself. So you've heard it, you've memorized it, and you're able to repeat it back. Now the Jesus of Luke tells this story of the Good Samaritan, and the Jews would have also have heard that one cannot touch somebody that has been uh, victimized because blood renders you impure. And so these people that are passing on that road to Jerusalem, they see this, this man and they decide that their duty to the temple is greater than your, their duty to a Gentile, to a Samaritan. Jesus is asking the question, who is your neighbor? And by telling this story of the Good Samaritan, what he is actually pushing us to consider is knowing God ultimately reflects itself in the arena of everyday life. It's not only this intellectual musing of what God demands from us or even this repetitive pronouncements of the things that we ought or ought not to do. It is hearing the word and then allowing the word and the knowledge of the one who spoke the word to impact the the way we operate in the realm of flesh and blood and that uh, i think ultimately leads us to the assessment that god values people above everything else and the way you protect yourself against deceit is by loving people scandalously, by 
placing them before your comfort or your pre predilections. And if you can do that, then I think you know scripture because you are actually living that ethic that Jesus lived by. Well, that's one of the things that's moved me more and more when I read the life of Christ, how much time he spent, whether it was with Judas or Pharisees or Sadducees, many of which you get a sense that he knew they weren't going to change. But yeah. you can see he put every effort, every all the cards on the table, so to speak, to put, use the expression, that every all the resources of heaven were put out to try and save and restore. And that's just such a, a moving thing to me. And one of the things that's become more and more clear to me, and for some this is probably obvious, facts don't keep us from deception necessarily. A relationship does. And I, I would argue even in our, our struggle with temptation and sin, my absorption of how I was taught, whether that was actually what was meant, I don't know, but my absorption, it tended to lean more to your value. If, if you were sinning, you were lesser. And, and then it would open up to these questions. If you, you cussed or something just before you head on collision and died, would, would, would you be gone for it? You know, would you lose out in heaven, all this kind of stuff? So the whole focus was kind of in this measuring up kind of thing as opposed to the relational dynamic. Now, all of these things are important. The restoring sin is a disease in any form in us. So any element of sin in our lives is tearing us down. So it is vitally important to keep looking to Jesus. But this idea that if I have the right facts or if I study my Bible so I'm not deceived, I'm going to measure up and I'm going to whether it's I've got the I figured out the right clues or I parsed the words just right, when you flip it into the relational dynamic, those things are still important, but they're done through the lens of a relationship with Jesus. Because something that's really profoundly moved me is the idea that when I sin, I bring sadness to God. Mm -hmm. We tend to think, oh, I've sinned. Oh, now I got to do something to be okay. Now, there is a reality that sin separates us. So there is clearly things that need to bring us together, but it's not to measure up. We are just sinners. And I, I just think that is so, so important when we come to the scriptures. And it, it just, it's, it's just such a, uh, a vital concept of how I live my life now. Yeah, look, um, I, think, I think facts are important. Uh, we, we like facts because facts allow us like I said, to articulate where we stand on, on certain positions. Um, but I, I think that facts um, are not as important as families. And I've, I've really had a paradigm shift, to over, over the past few years, where I began to ask myself, how does my life, in how does my Christian praxis look. If I approach faith as less of a factual enterprise and more as a, fa a familial dynamic, and I realize that I tend to be more grace-oriented towards people who disagree with me, and I hope that people who are engaged in that journey with me um, will extend the same grace when I get a couple facts wrong. Um, what I believe and what we share here, Stu, isn't the ultimate uh, arbiter of what is true. Um, you and I are, are individuals that are grappling with Scripture and attempting to provide simply our musings and to share our ideas of Scripture with, with the folks out there. But I think it's incumbent on our viewers and it's incumbent on us to decide what that relationship with Jesus is going to look like. And my prayer is that it is a relationship that respects facts, that is serious about facts, 
but in but one in which facts are subservient to family. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it because facts certainly are important. The fact that Jesus died for our sins, that's an important fact, <laughs> you know, and you can just go on and on. So I want to make sure people aren't getting the sense that we're trying to diminish even doctrine and, and these kind of things, but the role they, they play. Because something that's always concerned me, particularly more recently, there, there are quite a few people out there that it seems as though their ministry is heavily focused towards avoiding deception. And it kind of gets in this conspiracy theory kind of stuff. And, and even some of this stuff is, is legitimately to be concerned about. But it feels as though it takes people away from the focus on Jesus and the relationship not being deceived. Because ultimately, to me, is, is being deceived about the relationship. It'd be something in a marriage relationship where someone accuses your spouse or something and you believe and it's misleading or whatever that's the kind of deception that destroys the relationship Absolutely. so we don't want to be deceived because we don't want the relationship to be destroyed and I, I appreciate so much you said that hey listen you know we're we may not have all the facts right but it, it just though for some it may seem trite and i know for a time it was me this idea of relationship is 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 what drives it and when we're looking at doctrine when we're looking at making sure that we're not deceived or satan isn't pulling in it's all about destroying or breaking a relationship that's the focus and uh, i just i I know you kind of tell this is a little bit of a soapbox for me because it's it's just so easy and i'm including myself in this to kind of get into the facts and make sure i've got the facts right and then I don't get into the doing part. And I would argue that some of this leads to action, how we relate to other people. When we do the word, it doesn't have to be an evangelistic series. It can simply be allowing that word to change our behavior and seek for that behavior to change. Keep looking to Jesus. And when we see that we don't measure up or, or we're failing in the sharing of an accurate picture of Jesus, understand that Jesus feeling sadness to us and wants to reach out to us and lift us up and help us to share that. It's not a situation where we've broken free from the family because we made a mistake and said Jesus saying, yes, that was wrong, but you haven't broken the family. I'm here knocking on the door, um, trying to bring back and restore. And if we could relate to each other that way, when we see someone say or hear someone say, Uh, something that, um, you know, maybe even legitimately is is false, or you could even, the more dramatic heresy, can we come at that with love and compassion? Because ultimately facts are informative, they're not transformative. Um, I have a two-year-old, and my two-year-old has gotten, he's gotten into the stage which most kids get into when they start speaking, and that is the why stage. Um, so he was asking me about Jesus, and we uh, were talking uh, last Easter about the cross, and he said, why? He pointed at the cross, and he understands enough about what the, about the story that uh, that's not a pleasant place to be. So he simply asked, why? And I said, well, because, because he had to die. And in this, you know, two and a half year old's mind, that wasn't sufficient. So he said, why? And I said, well, because he loves you. And it clicked. The why was answered. And I think the facts tell us about the how, but we need to get better as people of faith at answering the why question. And it is my contention, Stu, that when we dig through all of the factual stuff and all of the dogmatic statements and all of the doctrinal musings and the creedal compositions, our whys are not as dissimilar as we may think. And if our whys are similar, then perhaps and just perhaps we can extend 
a bit more compassion to people whose processes might be different than us, uh, than ours. Uh, the answers are the same. The how we get to those are different. And so I, I want to make sure that we exhibit some kindness when asking questions about um, about hows. Well, as you know, Miguel, we've, we've talked about this a, a few times, and we even, I think, mentioned it in a couple of studies ago, that I was pretty sure, at least, that there are some pretty key things that we probably view a little differently. But one of the things I have been really profoundly impacted just in our conversations with with this Sabbath school is taking the time to listen and one, find that we're maybe not as far off um, or, or that different than originally thought. And some out there would say, well, maybe, maybe you're the one I'm off as too, and maybe I am, you know, whatever. <laughs> but I, what I, I see more is because taking the time to, to, to listen more, because I appreciate you, the person that's a given, but it's been so instructive to me experientially in terms of how we try and explore and understand things um, better. And one of the things is, is realizing the time here, we've got to wrap it up, but I wanted to, we don't, as I mentioned before, we don't typically do quote Ellen White because we really want to stay in the word, but I find so many of her quotes helpful as I try and understand the scriptures that points me in the right direction, whatever it might be. But there was a quote that was included in this lesson that I, I'd like to read. Um, no one is able to explain the scriptures without the aid of the Holy Spirit. But when you take up the word of God with a humble, teachable heart, the angels of God will be by your side to impress you with the evidences of truth. That's from Selected Messages, Book 1, page 411. It just comes back to that humility and teachable spirit. And uh, not only has the word continued to teach me, but in these con conversations with you this quarter, uh, I felt I have been taught of you, Miguel. Well, thank you, Stu. I'm, I'm happy we've, we've done this. I hope we can continue to do this. Um, I think, I, think uh, I, I just would like to finish our journey, at least in this quarter, uh, by noting something. When you talk about differences, Stu, you and I are about as different as, as two people can be, at least if you put us side, side by side. And yet we have so much in common. Yeah. So from a head guy, I, I want to tell you how deeply I am indebted to you for these conversations. Um, and Stu, if, if the Holy Spirit can bring you and I together through the commonality that is Christ, then perhaps the Spirit can do the same thing for our church and for our world. So my friend, from a Latin American to a Viking, I love you and thank you so much for, for your time and your thoughtful comments throughout this quarter. And, and with that, why don't you close us with a, a brief prayer? Absolutely. Jesus, you weave us together from different backgrounds and different cultures, different ideologies. And you call us to leave the, our flags behind, to leave those signs of preference and to wave away partisanship for your call is to dwell under the banner of Christ and the scripture bears witness to that Christ and as it bears witness it gives us insight on how we ought to live so we pray for a few things as we depart from this study we pray for your Holy Spirit for the presence of the angels for humility, for relentlessness, for faith, for hope, and unity. We pray these things in your name. Amen.
Amen. Well, we want to thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next week when we start a whole new focus of study. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.